Good day lords and ladies and welcome to Pillars of Eternity, the White March with me Cornish Knight. Since the new Pillars of Eternity game is coming out sometime in the near future I thought well it would be a pretty good idea to sit down and actually complete the original Pillars of Eternity and since I have recently purchased both the White March Part 1 and White March Part 2 DLCs I thought what couldn't be, be what could be better than actually just enjoying this game with you all. It's a very, very good game in this old style of Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter Nights. Lovely hand-drawn backgrounds and a deep, enriching story and a very complex and engaging system. So let's dive right in, shall we? Right, I'm going to go on normal. Normal difficulty, strategic and efficiency but forgives a few mistakes in combat. It's not recommended for newcomers of the real-time party-based RPGs. Well, I should be okay. I'm, I'm not going to try it on hard. I'm definitely not going to try it on Path of the Damned because that's pretty brutal, to be honest. Expert mode. Expert mode disables a number of helper features in the game. Players who want to rely on their own fast, um, faculties and intuition while playing the game should play expert mode. This option is selected when you start a new game. It cannot be enabled in game. If disabled, it cannot be re-enabled in game. Uh, fun if you're basically playing this for yourself, but because I'm doing this for a let's play, it may be, get a bit annoying. And Trial of Iron is basically Iron Man setting that if I die once, it's game over and the save is gone. So we're just going to do it on normal. Five wagons grope blindly for the path on a starless night, their master glancing ever upward to the skies for assurance that he is on the right course. A dim lantern, his only protection against the encroaching darkness. But the skies bring no comfort, shining no light, betraying no hint of what they know. The caravan carries travelers bound for the frontier hamlet of Gilded Vale, you among them where a local lord has offered land and wealth to settlers from abroad looking for a fresh start. You have taken suddenly ill, sweating and shivering, and one of the other travelers signals for the caravan master to stop on your behalf. He pulls up just in time to avoid plowing into the trunk of a fallen tree that bars the way ahead. You will go no further tonight. Oh, I do love that. I love this whole... I love fantasy RPGs. I love the original Dragon Age Origins. I love D and D. This is just, oh, this is one why this game is one of my favorite games of all time. Right, this is the character creation, ladies and gentlemen. It's, oh, I just love it. I love the fact that you can twirl the models. Oh, it's just so good, so good. Right, a woman's role in Aura. Eora, or Eora is largely dependent on what she is from, where she is from. In the Adria, Adria Empire, the Velen Republics and the Drywood women occupy many domestic, educational and organisational roles. They are the primary hunters, soldiers and leaders of the tribes of the Nastica, Taka, Nastica, in El, in Ir, Glen, Fal, Faf, Englafaf, and Xmetel, Xmel. The women and men have more fluidly social roles. In all societies, their exceptions to the rule and women can be found in a wide variety of stations and professions. And it switches to males, and it's, yeah, it's the same thing. Basically, amongst the tribes of Nastika men perform many of the homestead and organizational duties, blah, blah, blah. It's basically some of the roles are reduced, but in all honesty, gender doesn't really play much in this game. Now. I played, let's see, in Wastelands I played a man, and currently, hmm, let's mix it up a bit. Yeah, let's mix it up a bit. I haven't, I haven't played a female role in this game f before, so let's play a woman. Right. What do we want to do? We can be humans. Humans, commonly known as folk, are the most common race in the dry wood, and the Adrian, Adrian Empire, and the old Vel, Vel and the Velen Republics. 
though not as large as telling us all my humans are known for their strength and willpower. And if you hover over here, the Valen Republic's mercantile power and former col colony of a large, more ancient nation, Old Vale. The Republics lie south of the Dry Wood and Ill, Glafath, Glenfath, El Glafath, Glenfath, sorry. I always have problems pronouncing names. I'm ruled by a duo, a duo elected by, a, sorry, a duke elected. I suppose I, I thought I meant Jew like in um like a old medieval term for like a like a congregation, like a by a Jew elected, just Duke elected. They messed a K off. It's always messing me up. By Duke elected by the con Conciliar Assege, a uh, council of twelve dukes, including its five most prominent Duke Bells. Right, and the Drywood. A colonial nation founded by settlers from the Asia Empire. Following a series of conflicts with Asia, the territory became independent in 2672 AI and now ruled by a duke who is elected by several earls, then oversees its, that oversee its earldoms. So we get resolve. Resolve is the reflection of the character's internal drive, determination, and fearlessness, and an emotion and intensity it can project to others. It can be use useful for mental intimidation, leadership, and convincing performances in combat. It helps characters maintain a concentrated attributes to the will and deflecting defense defenses. And the might is obviously might is physical characteristics like combat and other and damage and healing and other kinds of things like that. I won't get too much into these. Right. So we have humans, we have Amora. The mighty Amora are largest of the Kith races and are commonly found in or near oceans. They are not truly aquatic, they have an affinity for water, and many of their civilizations, such as Rorotai, are based on na naval dominance. They are known for their unparalleled strength. It'll be interesting to see how these guys play in the next game, if, which is supposed to be mostly naval based. We've got the dwarves. By virtue of land covered a number of colonies settled dwarves are the most well travelled race in the world. They're commonly found in the dry wood, in the Valen Republics, and almost and among almost any colonized land. Dwarves are known for their greater strength and tenacity. So the Orma get plus two might, which as you can tell, yeah, might by sense physical characteristics of the head of the humans, minus one to dex. If you've played any RPGs before Dex, as you will, you know what Dex is. It's hand-eye coordination, balance, and grace. It's used for sleight of hand and fast reactions in combat. It affects the character's action speed as in, in, with all their attack spells and abilities and contributes to the reflex defense. And then your constitution, which is basically your health. And some other things, like endurance and fortitude. I'll cover some of the other systems. We have the elves... Elves in the, are the dominant race in Ur, uh, Glanfal, and the white, they, w the white that one wends, and extremely common in the dry wooden idea. Adria, I apologise for butchering in these names. I do. It's not naming, like reading names, is not my forte. Elves are known for their speed and intelligence, as well as the common, as a commonly isolationist nature. Orlan, or or Orlan, sorry, Orlan. All land are the smallest of the Kith races, though many cultures don't consider them to be civilized at all. Also notable for their large ears, two-toned two skin and hirsute bodies. All lands are commonly found in El Glanfaf. Territory can compromise the forest southeast of Bell River, populated indigenous by the co a group of loosely affiliated tribes collectively known as of the Glen Fames, Fafans, Glen Fafans, and governed by accounts of its six most prominent tribes. Ur Glenfaf is home to a large number of ruined F1 in sites, which Glenfafans hold sacred. The ruins have been at the centre of a number of large scale conflicts within the drywood colonists, whose settlements often encroach on the Glenfaf territory and would frequently seek to plunder the ruins of, for their relics. Yeah, interesting. The Imakatel Plains and parts of the drywood, they are known for their mental intensity and sharp senses, so they have plus to resolve, minus to might, but they have perception and perception it represents character sense of well as well as uh, character senses as well as their instinctive ability to pick up on details in interactions it can be used to catch someone in a lie to make an observant comment about 
her appearance or to notice something happening in the background. In combat it contributes to accuracy, the reflex defense and the grants a bonus to, in to interrupt. Interesting. And then you have the godlike. Yes. They are like this. The godlike are children of the kith, civilized races, who have been blessed with a physical aspect associated with gods, though some do not consider it a blessing. These aspects may take many forms and often come with mystical powers. Apparent head shapes are typical and godlike, are unable to wear protective headgear, it is, as it is near impossible to find anything that fits. Because of their unusual nature and their inability to reproduce, godlike are often viewed with fear and wonder. But you do, you, you get nice abilities with these guys, but obviously you lose the ability to um, wear helmets, which is not fantastic, but still. Um, uh, do I want to play a godlike? Maybe, perhaps. I haven't played many godlikes in this game. Why not? We'll play a godlike. So we can be a deaf godlike. Ooh boy. Man, that doesn't look nice at all. Deaf godlikes are most distrusted of their kind, strange, gross, cover their eyes and in some cases entire face, giving them a sinister appearance. The growths transparent like the godlike. The growths are transparent for the godlike, but opaque for the outside, hiding their features. Deaf Deaf often certain difficulties if yeah, okay. It, well it's deaf. Deaf godlike are commonly killed at birth because of many cultures consider them a power because of doom. Deaths are so when the deaf godlike attacks an enemy with 20 25% or less endurance, the damage is increased. Ah, oh, okay. The bodies of fire godlike often resemble hot metal, burnt wood, or stone with harmless flames that erupt from the cracks in their skin. The fire godlike are objects of both reverence and fear in the Dread Fire Archipelago. Many locals believe they have the power to awaken volcanoes or that killing one. Will cause a volcano to awaken. The dry wood godlikes often seen, or sorry, fire godlikes often seen as signs of a blessing of Magran, the god of goddess of war and fire. Battle forged. When reduced below 50 endurance, fire godlikes glow like metal in a forge, gaining damage reduction and doing a small amount of fire damage to any creature who hits them in melee. Ah, oh, that's cool. I do like I do like that look. And then you have the moon godlike. Ooh. But man, that's shiny. Moon godlike are most tolerated of the godlikes. Whilst their skin tone and large moon like growth on their forehead may be strange to some, their appearance is generally considered more palatable than the other kith. Sailors have many beliefs about the moon god um sailors have many beliefs about moon godlike and their properties to bring luck, though there are little agreement as to what kind of luck they tend to bring. Sewer tide, every encounter when re reduced below 75, 50, and 25 endurance, moon godlike generate waves of healing moonlight that restores endurance to men to them and their allies. Ah, that's interesting. And you have the nature godlike. Nature godlikes appear to fusion of human and animal features, often covered by plants, moss, and fungi. This has led to a commonly stigma that they are diseased and many are killed at birth because of it. Many druidic orders have, gre have a keen interest in nature godlike because their general curiosity as to how the souls occupy animals, plants, and stone. Wellspring of life grants a bonus to might constitution and dexterity when endurance is below 50%. Right. I'm thinking either fire godlike for the offensive ability or moon godlike because we could make somebody... I mean, that's really good for melee if you drop below your endurance. It just restores your endurance with healing, which would be a really for long encounters. Right. You get damage resistance. When an attack hits, there's one primary means of mitigating damage. Damage reduction. Damage reduction value is usually derived from armor, but many creatures have a natural damage reduction and can raise it through use of abilities, talents, and other equipment. Damage reduction is subtracted directly from all incoming damage. Okay. Damage will never be reduced below 20% of its initial incoming amount. Okay. So when we have this ability, we get a damage reduction and doing a small amount of fire damage to any creature who hits us them in melee. Which is okay. I mean, these guys seem, out of those two, these guys seem better, but I just love the fiery appearance. Yeah, let's go with a fire godling. Godlike. I haven't played one before. 
we can have a different body type because obviously they come from one of the original races. So we could go all an, have a little f fiery all an, have an elf, have a dwarf, an on ma'u. Human. Oh, we could we could make her. Um, I'm really tempted to make. Yeah, let's make her a body type like this. So there's like this giant wandering. In oh yeah, that would be cool. So cool. Yeah, I like this idea. Have her, like just. I'm really tempted to make her um like a paladin. Make her a paladin. Yeah, that would be so cool. Right, so this is a fire godlike. We can choose a class. Do you have all, you have your all your typical, um, typical RPG flavor? You have your paladins. Ooh, she's got glowing tattoos. That's so cool. Like, a, like, you can see like the light coming through from her skin. Man, that's awesome. You have like your barbarians, your druids, your fighters, your paladins. Anyone who's played like D and D will know will know the standard. Yeah, you've got your wizards, you've got your rogues, you've got your barbarians, and you've got. But there are other classes as well. You've got like your chanter. In every culture, in in every culture across or Eora, there are chanters. Many historians consider the chanters to be the most ancient works of magic. Their hallowed phrases stirring a collective memory of wayward souls around them, compelling them to to general to generate magical effects in the kind of reenactment in some societies, chanters form organizations, groups of storytellers and researchers, but in most parts of the world they're just time honored part of local folks. And so these bad guys are basically like bards in D D. Then you have the cipher. An ancient discovery in the Eastern Reach, ciphers were also called mind hunters by the Glenfallon ciphers have the ability to direct to direct contact and manipulate another person's soul and psyche using the allies or enemies essence as a focus for their magic. While most ciphers are still found in the Eastern Reach, practitioners of this technique are spread throughout the known world. They are generally accepted over time but they are gaining acceptance over time but generally distrust especially to the uneducated. So powers ciphers can direct target can directly target allies and enemies with powerful soul focused effects. These powers cost focus, which ciphers build through the use of their soul whip. That's cool. I haven't played one of these guys before, it'd be interesting to see. We get deflection, accuracy, endurance. There's a whole host of it will take us too much time to read through all of these. I mean, there's some really nice ones like Priest and all that kind of stuff, or Paladin. Paladins are mighty zealots and devoted to the god, to a god and ruler, and even a way of life. They can be found in many cultures and are fanatical, uh, where a fanatic group of like-minded individuals form a warrior society dedicated to advancing their cause. Amongst these aligned to their worldview, paladins are viewed with respect and admiration, if a bit of fear. Many paladins hold leadership positions in armies and mercenary companies, but in the heat of battle, their fantas um Fanaticism often overrules the chain of command and common sense. Faith and conviction. Paladins have an inherent bonus to all their defences. Often, over the course of the game, the value of their bonus may shift based on their reputa reputa reputation and the paladin gains relative to the behaviours that they are preferred by his or her god. So this will basically tie into a lot to our playing style if we play a paladin. That we actually have to RP them to be like how we say they're supposed to be like. But... I don't have a much problem with that. I'm thinking either the cipher, the cipher, or um, the paladin myself. I mean, I I want to play a class that I haven't played but much of before, and I tend to play a lot of like wizards and fighters and stuff. That's stealth, floor mechanics, paladins, athletics, and law. Ah, uh, let's go with a paladin. It means we have to RP quite a lot, which is what something I like to do in games. I like to RP rather right than meta game. Like, right, bleak walkers. Bleak walkers are soldiers dedicated to conducting warfare mercilessly and with extreme brutality in order to bring a swift end to conflicts. Because they are renowned for their most of their terrible and unyielding nature, most nobles will only call on them as a last resort. Bleak walkers' behavior behavior reinforces cruelty because they are quick. 
because their quickest resolution to a battle is one in which bleak walkers arrive arrival is announced and this surrender immediately follows to ensure that people understand there's no mercy will be given by bleak walkers they never give quarter under any circumstances that's that's bleak um favored dispositions cruel aggressive disfavored dispositions benevolent and diplomatic so we have to actually play to these particular styles by the way you notice that benevolent and diplomatic we we can we can be honest and brutal and cr like we can be honest and aggressive we don't have to be um these ones are their favored ones but at the same time we don't get penalties if we're not doing it we only get penalties if we basically benevolent or diplomatic so we could do that we could do dark onzel paladin the oldest known paladin order in the world the dark onzel paladin was founded by a guard of the Dark Ozil Palace of the Grand Vale of Vale over two thousand years ago. Since the shattering of the Grand Vale, the Paladin have transformed into a protectors and ambassadors for the immense Dark Ozil family as well as the old Vale as as sorry as well as old Valean cultures. Uh, the Dark Ozil Paladin Paladina Paladin are widespread and occasionally even come into conflict with each other due to the ma machinations of the Dacozi family. Paladins of the Order are renowned for their wit and love of life. So they are passionate and clever, but they do not like they do not like being cruel or stoic. We could be cold pack um gold pack knights. Gold pack knights are often sorry, gold pack knights are or are an order of mercenary paladins who sell themselves for all sorts of defence and offensive engagements. They emerged on the Pearl Coast a few hundred years ago and have managed to survive the structure of the Dwarven nation that created them. Gold Pack Knights are, are not especially brutal and are willing to shift uh, are willing to shift direction based on the desire of their employers. As they are as the name suggests, the Gold Pack Knights believe payment forms a binding contract. They are known for being non judgmental, professional and impressive and impressively mirthless. They are stoic and rational, they dislike passionate and aggressive. So they're basically like your like true amoral mercenary type kind of paladins, kind wayfarers, the most widespread paladin order. Kind wayfarers are guides and protectors for travellers, often people of limited means travelling in dangerous areas. Kind wayfarers lack the noble prestige of other paladin orders, but are widely respected by commoners for their generosity and compassion. Kind wayfarers lack a centralised structure, and many members are op operate independently in remote areas. Though the order is known for not being wealthy in recent years, they have improved their finances via cartography and work and working with groups like the Hand Hand the Cult to develop travelling guides for little known parts of Eora. They're benevolent passionate, they don't like being deceptive, but they don't like being people cruel. The sealed bearer is a Saint Elga. During a peaceful negotiation, an archer from the kingdom of Edja sought the noblewoman emissary of Cruel kin, Elga, in the arm, provoking battle. Elga, nevertheless, made a second attempt at negotiation, accompanied by three elven knights who only, whose only arms were sealed. They held in front of Elga to protect her. Elga succeeded, helping, helping form the Eldra Empire. The knights who protected her founded the sealed bearers of Saint Elga, who continue to act as guardians and diplomats. In Edra and beyond, they are well known for their host honesty and skilled negotiation. So they're honest, basically these guys are the opposite of the bleak walkers. I think a bleak walker would be interesting. Just because we're cruel and aggressive doesn't mean we have to be nasty, we could just be brutally honest. We could literally just be brutally honest to people. Let's do that. Right, we have two abilities we can select lay on hands which this is the ability we get at the beginning we can either have lay on hands fueled solely by belief the paladin is able to heal with the touch of his or her hand recovering substantial amounts of endurance for the paladin or any ally within range so every time we fight we get two per encounter per encounter ability can only be used for a set of number of times per in combat for example an ability that uses free yet so basically every time we fight something we can use that two times Ally target gains 54.9 okay, based yet. Yeah, that will change our levels endurance over 5 seconds. 
or we can have the flames of devotion. Calls upon the paladins in a faith uh, in a fire, causing their weapon to erupt in a burst of flame, adding burn damage to a attack. Nice. There are eight damage types in Pillars of Eternity, slashing, piercing, crushing, burning, socking, corroding, and freezing, and, and raw. Damage types are used to determine how easy a target resists damage of that type based on their damage reduction. A creature or a suit of armor may be very resistant to one type of damage, but quite vulnerable to another. Some weapons and attacks may do mult multiple damage types or listed as ore between the damage type. When an ore is listed, the attack will always do damage type that the target is most vulnerable to. Raw damage is the only damage type that ignores all the damage reductions and is generally associated with poisons and similar effects. Yeah, cool. So we have Devotion. Full attack, we uh, 5 to 8 crossing damage, plus 5 to 8 crossing damage for accuracy versus, versus deflection. It's increased by 50% damage as a burn, damage as burn, plus 20 to accuracy. So it's not too bad. It, it buffs all our attacks. I might go Flames of Devotion. Just because we're playing basically a flaming godkin or godlike. Right. Golden stars are the suggested ones for our class, basically. We have 15 points. Resolve. Resolve reflects the character's internal drive and determination, fearlessness, and emotional intensity that can project to others. It can be useful for mental intimidation, leadership and convincing performances in combat. It helps characters maintain concentration and, tr and contribute to the will and deflection defense. Highly recommended for paladins. Right, so we've got to put a couple of ones into resolve. Might is our physical attack. And we know constitution. I'm going to put a couple into constitution just because we're not particularly tough, I don't think, as a godkin. So, well, godlike, sorry. Godlike, I should say. So put that up. We have more health, more endurance, more fortitude. Fortitude resists attacks and inter uh, attacks on the internal physical systems of the character from poisons and disease and such like. Yeah, it's basically our toughness. Um, it is defined by the character's class, level, might, and constitution. Intelligence. Intelligence represents the character's logical and reasoning capacities and interactions that can be useful to deduct sudden realizations and problem solving combat it contributes to the will defense efficiency right and this is a strength so I'm going to put a couple into strength get the strength up to 14 I'm going to put a couple into um, intelligence so that will increase our area of effect uh, um, area of effect duration of all of our abilities and plus to our will power which is to resist stuff Will defense post attacks that are mentally based. Yeah, we'll put a couple more into resolve because resolve is like the massive thing for paladins. And then we'll probably put another one into constitution just to boost up our stuff. And I'll chuck another one into. And we want just, mm, just trying to think what we need. Do we want it in intelligence? Is nice, but I probably either want it in might or. In, Resolve. Resolve is important because it's highly determined for paladins. Oh, I'll just go straight up damage. I might just go straight up damage to be honest. Right. I can't remember what we got as Godkin. But fortunately, we can always jump back to Godkin so we get dexterity and intelligence. Right, okay. Yes. We've done that. Bleak Walker. That's done. That's done. So basically, dexterity and intelligence were already boosted by our race. So might is not too damaged. Plus, I would like to have might because our character is going to be slag um, sorry, slogging it out on the front line. Right. There we go. There's our stats. I do like how it all pops down once we're doing stuff. We can choose a culture. We can do Adria. The Adria Empire is currently the largest largest most powerful force in the part this part of the world is is at the centre around the equator and, and has a tropical climate for the empire has colonies in numerous areas of the world the greater Adria is at heart and houses the majority of human and elven nations so these things all these different cultures will go into our attributes so we can do the dreadfire archipelago if we wanted 
consisting of nations of the nest tag dozens of or more Agmo Ma'u uh, I can never pronounce that name Omar settlements and hundreds of low lawless pirate infested islands that stretch along the southern seas. Dreadfire is the home to Burral dwarves, Omar and a mixture of variety of her races. Dreadfire Palgo is is the last stop for anyone heading east. A multitude of monstrous sea creatures infest the oceans beyond, making travel virtually impossible. Or we can have the Xtamel Plains Xmetal Plains, located in the northeast of Ir Glanfath. The Exil Plains are the largest expanse in the fertile savannas that are extensively farmed by humans and all in residence. In Mixtel culture is often the oldest in the world, though one of the least imperialistic, having spread out little over the past several thousand years. As you notice, our culture is actually affecting how our character looks. Old Vale. Old Vale. Vila. Vila. I always have problems with the names. Once the crown jewel of the southern seas, Old Vale is now a crumbling remnant of the empire of a way of um of an empire of warring merchant nations, counting many humans and dwarves amongst their ranks. The old Valian con Valian Valian countries are still forces to be reckoned with and are proud of their rich cultural history. Ratai, Ratai are dominated by the Orma nation of Ratai. The Gulf itself is host to a number of nations, most of them Orma, Orlin, or Dwarf. For these countries are relatively young, they are some of the most advanced colony settlements in the East. The Gulf is a land of riches and resources for those who can take them, for the entire coast is often plum, plum and pummeled by violent storms. The Living Lands The Living Lands are the mountainous regions are the mount sorry, the living lands are in is the mountainous region of a large northern island renowned for its diversity of plant and animal life. Its weather is unpredictable and off and its ecosystems are very dramatically from valley to valley. The living lands are home to assortment of races and a variety of colonies and independent settlements. And that will increase our might. The white that wends. The large Cracked southern expanse of polar ice, the white that wends is the home to the pale elves and the small colonies of daring explorers, outcasts, and adventurers. While virtually no plant life grows in the white, it is home to many hardy species of dangerous animals that forage from the seas or prey upon each other to survive. So, what do we want to have? That would increase our might. Constitution. Eh, what do we want? Intelligence. I mean, getting our con up would probably be nice because it means more health, more endurance, and stuff like that. Uh, we could. Tr what's one? I mean, we could do one that gives us more intelligence. Because then we would have intelligence of 15. Oh, that, it, it changes up there anyway, so it's be 14 across the board for all our stuff. I mean, this doesn't really affect. It affects like our background, how people react to us. Our starting gear, I suppose. What should we go? Let's go with this one. Rorotai, Rorotai. That sounds like an interesting one. Seems fitting for someone like a war paladin to basically come from. Backgrounds. Right, so we can have our aristocratic, which is basically you lived a life amongst the nobles. Your day has been marked by lavish meals. Extravagant parties and your conversations peppered with the talk of predigree and bloodlines. Pardon me. We could be a drifter. Well, sorry. That increases our law. We could be a drifter. You never quite fit into many, ma no matter where you go. Each new town is just a place to rest briefly before moving on to the next. You're more comfortable on the road traveling the world. That gives us stealth and mechanics. Stealth is basically for stealthing, as it says. This, and mechanics is used for traps and locks and picking stuff. Um, 
interestingly these aren't really tied so much to classes and stuff so anyone can do anything really which is something that I like you could be a labourer, your life has been spent in the study of your craft, trained and prepared, you're ho hoping to hone your skills and apply your trade. You could be a merchant, you're trading goods from all over the world. You could be a slave, yeah, athletics and survival. You could be a dissident, you made a name for yourself as a troublemaker, dis disrespect for authority and lack of care. Regarding the rules or occurring themes in your life that increases our strength, our stealth, and our law. Law presents a character that accumulated mis miscellaneous knowledge and trivia, often of the occult and esoteric topics. Outside of conversations and scripted interactions, law is used to activate scrolls. Higher law values allow the character to use high level scrolls. Hmm. We could be a hunter, which would increase our survival and our stealth, which is useful. Survival allows the character to choose from a variety of long term bonuses each time they camp. Because basically in this thing you have to camp to get stuff back. It's basically a bit like D&D &D or any of the older R like CRPGs where to get some of your abilities back you have to camp and if you and your endurance and stamina would decrease as you place so you have to rest at places or you have to camp. Um, mercenary blade in battle is your way of life. You solve your problems by pulling out your weapon and applying force. So we get athletics and we get law. Adventurers is a tiring work. In addition to hazards of mortal combat, adventurers have to have walls to climb, rivers to cross, and pits to leap over. Once per encounter, characters with athletics can use the second wind ability to cover lost endurance. A higher athletic score increases the effect of second wind. In conversations and scripted interactions, athletics is used for physical feats like clambering, swimming, and jumping. And well, we have scholar. For you, knowledge is the relentless pursuits you hoard each kernel of information as though you were pre as precious metal and and time you don't spend learning is time wasted. Let's go with mercenary because it seems to fit the ideal that we're going for this character that she's some kind of basically war paladin who goes from place to place inspiring dread and fear and burning her enemies with her holy flames and all that good RPG stuff. Right. We can change our colour, which is cool. We can also change our portrait. Let's try and find one that suits her better. So these are the elves. We have the godkin. There's not many female godkin, that's disappointing. So we can have her, or we can have her. Let's go with this one. This one looks awesome. Right, we can go choose colours. That's her clothing by the looks of it. Since we are playing someone, uh, I am technically playing someone that I am a Cornish Knight after all, so perhaps we should go for the Cornish colours. Black and gold. This is trying to figure out which version that we want to have it. Do we want to have it this way? Yeah, I prefer it having this way because you can see the detail on the armor and stuff better. But black and gold for her colors. And we can change her head. I can't get closer from here, unfortunately. Nope. Okay, so... Which one do we want? I like this one, actually, because you can see her face better. Even if the eyes are a bit lifeless compared to some of the other ones. I mean, that one's not so bad, but... I do like this... This face, I don't so taken on the horns. But I do like this face, yeah. And we can choose a voice. Female, let's see. Mm -hmm. I shall lead us. Let's go. Time to see and not be seen. Hmm. Now I am leader of the group. Bring them down! 
keeping quiet. Huh? Follow me. Damn, these are some really good voices. Death to our enemies! Nothing will slip past me. Hey there. I shall lead us. Nah. Let's go! Time to see and not be seen. Hmm? I've got this. Let's go! They won't see me coming. What is it? Now I am leader of the group. Let's go! Keeping quiet. Yeah? Follow me. Hmm, maybe. You're mine! Quick and quiet. Just say the word. I'll lead the way. You better run! Yeah, let's go with this one. I'll go on ahead. Yeah? We want to have a very... very... very confident paladin. Now, what should her... what should her name be? Cornish Knight doesn't really sound appropriate. Hmm... <laughs> Gwen. Yeah, let's go with Gwen. And she needs a surname. Gwen Blackheart, maybe? Hmm. She's supposed to be a nasty paladin. So let's go... Hmm. Blackheart. Gwen Blackheart. Or Ravenheart. Actually, that's a better one there. Gwen Ravenheart, let's go. And she looks like a badass. Right. But folks, this is going to be good, let's go. Caravan Master Odmer, Odmer, sorry, Caravan Master Odmer. The Caravan Master finishes dressing the group, his bussy red moustache and sacking jowls quiver as, as if for emphasis. Everybody stays close to the wagons, got it? Stay out of the woods, and beasts take you if you were planning a stroll through those ruins up there. He nods to the towards the looming black mass on the hillside. Whole area is crawling with hut dwelling types who would be happy to stick an axe in you for trespassing. So mind that you don't track mud on their sacred blazing rocks. Tonight everybody stays put, and in the morning we'll get the path cleared. Gilded veils less than a day out. Understood? At least the cavern master at last and the cavern master turns to you, frowning as he looks you over. Touch of the rumbling rot could be. There's a stinging beetle round here carries it. You'll be fine once it passes your innards. Unless you don't drink water, of course. Which case you'll be dead in a day. Ugh, that's not good. There's a berry grows in these parts, small and pink, called a springberry, about the size of a fingernail. Give you cramps if you eat it, but the frontiersmen make a tea from it. Calms the insides. Should get you through the night. You might check around, see if you can find some. Meanwhile, I'll see if we can scare you up some water. I know you want to hunt before it gets much darker, but see about refilling our water first. Got a sick one here. Right. Odomer looks over his shoulder at his assistant, a lanky, intense man named Sparfell, who carries an old sun-bleached bow. I know you want you want to hunt before it gets much darker, but seeing, but see about refilling our water first. Got a sick one here. He nods in your direction. Yeah. Sometimes the dialogue kicks in before you get a chance to read us. Sparfell nods and slides the worn bow over his shoulder. So we have some options. Where where would I find the berries? They grow on a bush that's common round here, kind of funny looking. You'll know it when you see it. Doubt you'd have to go far off the road to find one. Uh, Gwen looks up at the ruins. What are these ruins, he inquires. Nothing you won't see on half the hills of Air Glonfoth. Money to be made selling their knickknacks in Defiance Bay, if you don't mind getting stuck with Glonfoth and arrows now and again. They didn't build them, but I'll be the effigy if they don't watch them like a mother bear. Of course, all the ones around here have been ransacked ten times over. Got nothing left worth half a pawn, so I hear. He adds with a wink. Your character's attribute, skills, class, race, culture, and sex may all open options for you in the, in the dialogue. 
These options are necessary superior are not necessarily superior to others but give you a wider variety of choices to select from. The manner in which someone responds to your choices depends on their individual personality and attributes. So each character, each NPC is built differently and they react to you differently and your reputation and manner and sort of like perceptions that people have for you play into this. Who did build who did build the ruins? You inquire. Well Gwen inquires. Got different names for them. Settlers called them in Gwithens. Nobody that liked them enough to stop them becoming ruins tell you that much. Yeah, well, nothing stays forever, I suppose. Is it dangerous out here? You inquire as you glance around. Not if you hurry about your business. And not if the weather holds up. There is concern in his tone, but he does not elaborate as he glances around. What kind of weather do they get out here? This time of year, rain mostly, and wind. But there's a different kind of wind out here time to time. Locals call it a beowick, born out of the ether, the spirit's path. Never seen it myself, never care to. Man, that doesn't sound ominous at all, does it, folks? But so be it. What are these huge rocks coming out of the ground? They don't got Audra where you come from? Well, it just grows up out of the ground like this. Goes deep like tree roots. Some of it all the way to the heart of the world, you believe the stories. It's more like a shell than a proper rock. Easier to work if you're a mason. Got all kinds of strange properties. Seems to have some kind of life of its own. Dies if it gets dug up. Loses its luster. Folks think it probably grew at one point or another, but not these days. Interesting. The soul butchers in Defiance Bay use it for different things. I've heard tell it can hold a man's soul, but I don't care to see it. Got enough to worry about without seeing something like that. Well, you glance around. Well, Gwen glances around. I'll go and see about these berries then, she declares. Hold on. Take someone with you. I know you're not some helpless tenderfoot. Not like most of this lot. But you drop dead. I don't want to be looking for the body. Got a schedule to keep. He scans over the travellers, resting his eyes at length on a sturdy, armor-clad woman who has spent the journey's, journey's night sleeping on uneven ground without a blanket or pillow. Kalisha. Kalisha! The woman looks up, looks up on her own time. She needs to find some spring berries. What? But she doesn't drop dead, declares the, the caravan master. No promises. She declares. What kind of guide says something like that? Kind you can afford. Don't listen to her. You're in good hands. And I pay too well, if anything. He declares he casts her a sideways look. Off with you. Aiden should have supplies. See that you're equipped before you head out. We're in harsh country. Get your berries and hurry back. And if you get so much as a tickle of wind, you drop everything and you run. Something in the air tonight. If it's a beowick, we'll shelter in the ruins. Hut dwellers be damned. Old Mayor's small, gr small, small grin recedes beneath his moustache as he says this, and his stir and he is stern once more. You heard the man. Let's get going before you keel over. Right, and this is where we're going to end it for the day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Cornish Knight. This is the beginning of our tale. We can uh, party consists of the five additional companions or adventurers while the caravan is camped outside the Glaffen ruins. Od Odma has assigned Kalisa to help you. Kalisa is a fighter class that excels in close quarter defense. Use her abilities to com comfortable into your own. To select a party member, yep. Yeah. Okay, select the portrait. Or press a number on the button corresponding to the number in the party, starting with one at the left. To select multiple party members, click the hold anywhere on the gr on the screen and drag. So it's just normally how you do it. To select more characters, click anywhere on the screen where your character is and circle select a circle of four wedges. All selected characters will in will path to their corresponding position in the formation. If you are C red, a red circle with a slash through it, you cannot walk off on that part of the map. When multiple party members are selected, the axe and bar is and hidden. To see an individual character's option, select only one character. Right, we have our 
log here, as you can see, it has a record of what everyone is saying. We have our combat log. A whole host of different stuff. We can pause time. We can keep time going, we can slow time down, but that's everything that will be count covered in the next session. I've been Cornish Knight. Can do. This is Gwen Ravenheart as we start on her tale of adventure. And I shall see you all next time. If you've liked, please press the like button. If you wish to subscribe, please press the subscription button. You can follow me on Twitter, you can follow me on Steam. And this has been Pillars of Eternity, The White March. I shall see you all next time. Goodbye.